And uh, even today, with all the change world, and uh, we can be glad that we're Americans, um, United States citizens. Um, but in opposite of that, what's the, uh, today is the Independence Day, and it's a day that we celebrate the independence from Great Britain in the Revolutionary War. And the opposite of independence is surrender, isn't it? And uh, that's actually what I'm going to talk about this morning. We've been talking about the church, and I want to talk a little bit about who is the head of the church and uh, why we need to surrender completely to him. In Luke, the 14th chapter, in Luke chapter 14, we have some verses here that Jesus speaks on discipleship. And he has a great big crowd here. There's a large following of Christ at this point. There's multitudes there. And uh, if Jesus was of the mind that I'm just trying to get a big crowd, he would have never spoken these words because these are not popular words. These are not things that people really want to hear. And this is not a, uh, a seeker-oriented message. This is something that is hard, and it's most people don't want to hear because it involves total surrender. If we look here in Luke, the 14th chapter, we're going to start here in verse 26. Well, let's just start in verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and he said to them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister... Yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost? Where does he have sufficient funds to finish it? Lest happily after he has laid the foundation and it is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? Going to war against another king does not sit down first and consults whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Does that sound like something that you'd hear on TV from a TV evangelist? No, that's something that Christ preached, and he had a great multitude following him, and yet he still was uh, willing to say these words, still willing to say this out loud. I read about a man that had open heart surgery, and he was having a bypass, and, and uh, during his recovery, the doctor prescribed an exercise program, and he emphasized to the patient that you need to do this exercise religiously. A few weeks later, the doctor went back to see the, the, the physician, and he asked him how the exercise was going. And he goes, I'm glad you only made it one day a week. He goes, one day a week? What are you talking about? You said religiously, doctor. I go to church one day a week. I exercise one day a week. You know, that's what people think. But you know what? There's something not quite right about that, is there? That man's recovery depended on his exercise. If he didn't exercise, he won't recover completely. And it depended on him doing more than once a week. When the doctor said religiously, the doctor meant every day. But unfortunately, in our society, religiously means when you feel like it. Because that's what religion is all about. It's what makes you feel good according to our society. That's not according to God, but according to our society. Here in this passage, Jesus is telling the same thing about Christians. He goes, we need to take our faith seriously. Unless you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You have to be more than just a passive uh, hobby, more than just a, a little bit of uh, here and now, once in a while, whenever I feel like it. We need to be at work every day, not just because Jesus said it, but because our life depends on it, just like this patient. Did Jesus, uh, is this the only time he said it? No, he said it in other places too. If you look at Mark, the 8th chapter, Mark chapter 8, and verse 34, he says, When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said to them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
By the way, when he says, take up his cross and follow me, this meant that you would follow him to the death. A lot of people, we, we understand that, well, this is my cross to bear because I have this sickness or because I have this pain or because I have this situation that I'm in. But when you said that in those days, that when whoever comes after me must take up his cross and follow me, the cross was a death sentence. You didn't come back from going to the cross. When you went to follow Christ, when Christ said this, he meant total commitment. And the people understood what he meant when he said this. They said, wow, this guy is really serious about this. I don't know if I can make that kind of a commitment. And, uh, and, and that's what people thought. Matthew, t the 10th chapter, Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. Not only does Jesus say that you need to do this, he said, if you don't do it, you're not worthy of me. And that the same thing is said in our text. If anyone does not carry his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Who does not give up everything he has to follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is serious. Following Jesus requires us to exercise our faith regularly. It means that we should do it every day. There was a minister that was asked about a man that went to church there or that was supposed to be a member of the church. And he asked the minister, does John belong to the church? The preacher's reply was no. Although his name is on our roll, the man was a little confused. And he goes, what's the difference between belonging to the church and his name on the roll? Well, it's like this, the minister explained. I'm not talking about John here, by the way. If anybody here named John, I know there's a few of you. Uh, <laughs> John's time doesn't belong to the church. His energy and affections don't belong to the church. And not one penny of John's money belongs to the church. To be perfectly honest, I don't think there's an ounce of John that really belongs to Jesus. See, I think there's a lot of people kind of like John that like to be known as part of the church, but they don't really belong to the church. There's a lot of people that want to go to heaven with Christ but hardly an ounce of them belongs to Christ. Jesus tells these people, they're not worthy to be my disciple. That's what he says here in Luke, the 14th chapter. In order to be a disciple of Christ and a member of the Lord's church, we have to understand a few things. The first thing we need to understand is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And he is Lord in every aspect of that word. We have to understand that. When somebody said, uh, who is your Lord in the first century, they meant, who is your master? Who is the one that controls all that you have? He makes sure that you stay busy from sunrise to sunset. He controls your life. He controls your children. He controls your assets. Anything you have belongs to him. They understood that concept in the first century. In fact, that's why it says there um, about the, in Romans the 10th chapter, and about uh, whoever confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord will be saved. It was more than just saying uh, Jesus is Lord. Everybody will say that nowadays. But back in those days, that meant that he was your master, that you were his servant, that you were his bond servant. And so in Luke 14, Jesus tells us these couple of parables. First about the man that's going to build a tower and a parable about a king that's going to war. And Jesus tells us these parables are an illustration of what it means to be his disciples. So when we get to the point in our lives that we want to give our lives to Christ, we need to consider that from this point on, we are working for Him. When we're building the tower, it's not our tower. The tower belongs to Christ. When we're going to war, it's not our battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. And it's His battle that we're fighting. And when we're Christians, we're added to the church. It's not our church. It's His church. It's not our, our place. It's, it's his place. You know, and that makes it a lot easier to get along with everybody else because when you recognize that it's not Wayne's church and it's not Mike's church and it's not Brian's church, it's the Lord's church, it makes us realize that we're on the same team, we're working for the same master, we're trying to accomplish the same task, and it's not about us. It's not about what we do and about uh, how far we get or how far they're doing, but it's about how much we're doing for Christ. When Jesus said uh, to the disciples there in Matthew, the 16th chapter in verse 18, he says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He's going to build his church. 
Jesus is the rock. It's not Peter that's a rock. It's that the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what it says there in uh, Ephesians, the second chapter. We ask what the, what the foundation of the church is. Not only is he the head of it, he's the foundation of it. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 20... <clears throat> It says, and we, built, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You look over in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. We know this verse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. He is the rock that church is built on. It's not Peter. People got this Catholic ideology, ideology uh, where they believe that Christ, Peter was the first pope, and that's why he's called the rock there. And he is not called that. It's on Christ that the church is built, not on Peter. And uh, it's his church, and he's the one that built it, and he's the one that, that keeps it going. And we are just workers in the kingdom of God. How we look at Jesus and the church depends on how we answer these following questions. I want you to ask yourself these questions. Does Jesus belong to me, or do I belong to him? So I hear a lot of people say, well, I received Jesus as my Savior. How do you know that Jesus received you? That's the question I have for you. Yeah, I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. How do you know that Jesus accepted you? Which way is it for you? If Jesus belongs to me, I do his bidding. I'm at his beck and call. I do what he wants me to do. I serve him. But if he belongs to me... He does my bidding. And when I'm in trouble, I'm going to call to Jesus. Even though I've never done anything for him, I've never given my life completely to him. But I'm just going to depend on that. See, like I said, Romans 10, 9. Part of our salvation is confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all that that means. And all that that means. And I think sometimes we, we get to the point in our society. I, I bet if I went out and I asked the average religious person, the person that goes to church maybe uh, every so often, and I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord? They would say yes. And if I went on to say, well, does that mean that he controls every personal decision, every financial decision, that you go to Jesus Christ and you let him have control of every aspect of your life? They would say, well, no. Well, unless Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, He is not your Savior. He has to be both Lord and Savior. Unless you have Him as your Lord, you cannot be His disciple. That's the conditions that He set. He's the one that said it. I'm not making those rules up. He said it. He has to be the Lord of all. You look at a, a slave in the first century, somebody that would call somebody else Lord. If you called somebody else Lord and Master in the first century, it meant that you were a slave. You didn't have any rights. You didn't own anything. You didn't own your home. You didn't own your furniture, your family. You didn't even own the clothes on your back. They belonged to somebody else. When somebody wants to become a Christian, they need to realize that everything belongs to Jesus. You can take out your wallet, your purse, you open up, Jesus owns this. He's going to own this. You could take the pictures of your family that you might have in there. Jesus owns this. Take your books, your hobbies, your cars, your possessions, your houses, your lands. They all belong to Christ. That's a decision that we have to make when we become a Christian. Am I going to give lordship to Christ? Am I going to submit? Am I going to surrender to what he wants me to do? See, Jesus builds his church with individuals that confess him as their Christ, who make him their Lord. That's who he builds a church on. On this rock, I will build my church. The Lord adds to the church those that are being saved. The Lord is the one that builds the church. He's the one that decides whether you're in or whether you're out. And he knows your heart. You might have gone through the rituals. You might have said all the right things. You might have even um, done everything that everybody's asked of you. But in your heart, you've been holding something back. And in your life, you've been holding something back and say, you know what? You can have all of this except for this one area. I have this one thing that I can't really give up. I have this one area that's not really important to me. And uh, you, you can't have that. Jesus knows that. He knows who's in the church. He knows who's there. <clears throat> 
His church is made up of people like you and me. His church is a, depends on people like you and me. And here's another question to ask yourself. If the whole church were just like you, the whole church was made up of people just like you, would it survive? Would we have to close the doors because you can't afford to give a tithe or offering because that's way too much and you won't have enough to pay the bills? Or would it have to give up because you don't have time to go witness to your friends and family about Christ? Or you don't have time to work at VBS? Or you don't have time to do these other things because there's other things that are more important. If everybody in church did just what you do, could Christ's kingdom last very long? One man had this thought about the early church. If the habits of the company in the upper room had been like the habits of multitudes in our churches today, the meeting was called for the first day of the week, but so many things interfered, so the company of 120, only 40 could be present. Peter and his wife had bought a cottage on Lake Galilee, and they were away from the hot city over the weekend. Bartholomew had had guests over, and he couldn't come. Philip and his family had been up late the night before, and they'd overslept. Andrew had a business conference with a new fishing boat, and James had to stay home and cut the grass. Do you think the church would have survived if we had apostles like that? No, they understood that there's more important things than cutting the grass. There's more important things than being at a lake. They realized that this was a total commitment, and when Christ went to the cross, they abandoned him. But when he came and rose from the, rose from the dead, and he, he gave them all power, they realized that this is their life. There's nothing more important than this. And this is all this life is about, is about the church and following Christ. And there's nothing more important than any, anything else. You could be the President of the United States. It's not more important than being a Christian in the Lord's church. All right, this is the most important thing that we have. It's not your church, it's the Lord's church. The, the church wouldn't have survived if we had men like, like those in those days. We have the mindset today that you can be a Christian part-time. Once you give your life to Christ... You need to give your life to Christ. People say, well, I became a Christian of the night. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Does it mean you got a certificate? Or does it mean that you became the bondservant of Jesus Christ? I hear all kinds of excuses of why people can't be fully committed to Christ. Well, it's boring. And it's not as important as long as I'm basically a good person. I'm basically trying to do what's right. Or I can't get my kids to sit still in church. I, don't, I can't come on Sunday night because I, but there's nothing for the kids and, and they'll get bored. And, and uh, you know what? <clears throat> Are you a servant of Christ or not? Is the kingdom of God important to you or not? Well, there's a game on. There's a race on. You know, it's a good thing. You probably don't live in Pakistan or Iraq or... Iran or China or someplace like that because over there, if you decide to go to church and attend church, it could mean that you could get killed. And that's what it could mean in the first century. These people understood that. To go to church and assemble with people that no longer followed the laws of Judaism could mean that they got killed. And it did mean death for many of them. Do you think the church could have survived if they only built half a tower for Christ or waged the war part-time? I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord, but I only work on Sunday for two hours. What kind of an army would, would, would triumph with those kind of uh, soldiers in it, you know? Uh, but that's the way a lot of Christians act. These men, these apostles, they did count the cost and they're willing to pay the price. You know what happened to them? By all accounts, we have some history from what happened. Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword in Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the streets of the city. Luke was hanged from an olive tree in, the, in Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil but escaped death in a miraculous manner and was afterward uh, abandoned to the Isle of Patmos. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. James the Greater was beheaded at Jerusalem. James the Less was thrown from the top of the temple and beaten to death. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was bound to a cross where he preached to the persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through the body with a lance in the East Indies. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. 
Barnabas of the Gentiles was stoned to death at Salonica. Paul was at length beheaded by Nero in Rome. What was Paul's thoughts about all these possibilities? You know what? It's tough to be a Christian. I understand if you guys want to be secret Christians. No, Paul's idea was for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He recognized that even if somebody took his life, that he had still conquered because death has no victory over Christians, does it? We don't have that attitude, though. We have an attitude where if it's uncomfortable or we don't have padded pews or it's not cold enough or it's not hot enough, then we're not going to go to church. But these guys had a total commitment to Christ. These men weren't Sunday Christians. These men were willing to build the tower for Christ. They were willing to wage the war on his behalf. They were willing to work in the kingdom and to put it first in their lives. And because of this, and others down through history, who have been willing to count the cost and willing to pay the price, the message of Christ has survived to this day so that we can have access to this kingdom and to be part of this war and to build this tower. We need to do it. We need to do it for Christ. But it takes surrender and we need to recognize that Jesus is Lord. So are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? Are you willing to give up everything and follow him? Are you willing to make the, Jesus the Lord of your life? Another thing we have to realize this morning is that there is a cost of discipleship. There's a cost in discipleship. Notice what Jesus tells us in the parable. Suppose a man goes to build a tower and he gets halfway done and he runs out of funds. Everybody comes by and makes fun of him because this guy started to build and couldn't finish. We've seen a few places of that, like that around town, you know, where people started to build something and for whatever reason it failed or it flopped and it's still standing there half built and people make fun of it, right? And then also the man that, that goes to, to wage a war and he, he's outnumbered. Can he afford to go to war or should he sue for peace? Should he sit down and count the costs? Why is Jesus telling us these parables? He doesn't want us to misunderstand that there is a cost of discipleship. There's a cost of being a disciple. But wait, you might say, I thought salvation was free. How many think that salvation is a free gift of God? Amen? It is a free gift of God. It is. It is salvation. Salvation is free. But there is a cost when it comes to discipleship. And uh, there's no way that you and I could ever pay the price that is necessary to get into heaven. Jesus paid the price. And that way, it is Free, but there is some cost involved. You say, well, let me, let me illustrate it this way. Suppose uh, uh, my parents died and I inherited $50 million. Now, my dad said, where would you get the $50 million from? He doesn't have it. All right. But, all right uh, suppose I got $50 million and I said, you know, because I like the congregation, the church here at Reno, I'm going to buy everyone here a new car. All right. And uh, that'd be a good deal, wouldn't it? Would you like to get a new car? And uh, but once you got that new car, you're going to be responsible to pay the insurance and you're going to be responsible to put the gas in the tank and you're going to be responsible to put new tires on it when they wear out and you're going to be responsible to do the repairs. Is it still a good deal to get the new car? But there's some cost in owning. Yeah, it is a good deal. Someone's shaking their head no. Yeah, you get a $20,000 car, that's a good deal, all right? Even if you have to pay the taxes and insurance and all the other stuff. But... Uh, there's still some cost in, in, in the upkeep and in maintaining that new car. You get a brand new car for free. But once you get that brand new free vehicle, you've got to pay the upkeep on it. There's still some cost in owning it. Your salvation is free, but discipleship is going to cost you something. Jesus said it's going to cost you your whole life. That's what it's going to cost you. You've got to take up your cross daily and follow him. If you've got to be willing to give up everything you have to make him your top priority, you know why? It just won't work any other way. It won't work to do it halfway. It's kind of like jumping a gap. You can't jump halfway. All right? You've got to take it all or nothing, and that's the only way it'll work. Many of the people in Jesus' days followed Jesus 
didn't think it was worth the cost of discipleship because they followed him as long as he was doing miracles, as long as he was healing people, as long as he was feeding people miraculously. They were willing to follow him. But when Christ went up on the cross, they said, this is too much. This is too much. And many turned away and didn't follow him. There was a lot of people that were there for the good times, but they wouldn't go through the bad times. Is it worth the price? Remember the parables we talked about last week, the parables of the kingdom of God? The kingdom of heaven is like a man who goes and finds a treasure in a field. And uh, he goes and he sells everything he has to buy that field to get that treasure. Is it worth it to get a treasure? If you found a treasure worth millions of dollars, you sold every asset you had, you had enough to buy that field. Would you do that? Well, sure, because that treasure outweighs everything you have. Or about a merchant that deals in pearls and he finds this pearl that's worth more than anything else and he gives up everything he has to buy that one pearl because it's worth more than all that he has. See, that's what salvation is. Salvation is like that pearl. Salvation is like that treasure. It's worth it to give up everything you have to get that pearl because it's a great treasure. And nobody can take it away from you. Thieves can't take it away from you. Uh, it doesn't ma rust or corrode. Moths don't eat it. You know, it's an eternal treasure that nobody else can take away from you. It's worth it. It's the kingdom of God. So Jesus is offering us something that is greater than any earthly value. It's offering us is, is eternity. He's offering us the love of God. He's offering us forgiveness for every sin that we've ever committed. Your name written in the Lamb's book of life. You can't buy that. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care uh, who you know or uh, how many uh, phone numbers that you can call somebody important up this earth. You're never going to find somebody here on earth that can write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. All right? You can't pay enough money to get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's only one way to do it, and it's through Jesus Christ. And we have to go through Him. But is it worth the price? Because you have to give up everything. If it isn't worth it to you, I'm sorry. But you cannot be his disciple. That's what he said. If it isn't worth it to you, you cannot be his disciple. In the early church, when people wanted to become Christians, they were told they were dying to their past sins. They had to die. They had to repent of their sins. Consider them dead. And then they were bury the dead man in water. And they would rise in newness of life. At this point, they were made to realize that their past life was gone and all that they once held dear was now dead and every possession that they had now belonged to Christ. They recognized that that change happened when they were saved at baptism. You know, baptism is a symbol of the decision to give everything to Christ, to give up our hold and our, our reach on our past life and the, on the things that are dead, the things that held us back, the things that bound us to Satan. We're going to give up on those things and we're going to die to those things. We're going to bury that dead man in water and we're going to rise as a new creature. All things forgiven, all things new. Even pagan religions recognize that baptism is the point in which you change. In India, they don't care if a family member attends church. Even pagan and non uh, But once you are baptized into Christ, you're kicked out of the family. In Jewish circles, a person may embrace Christian faith in secret, but once they are baptized, the family will ostracize them. In Islamic cultures, it's worse. Once an Islamic person converts and is baptized, he must be sent away immediately, or if they find out about it, he will die within two or three days of his baptism. Baptism is the mark of a changed life. It's a mark of our decision to surrender our entire lives to God. There's an old gospel song. It says, they baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. Jesus gained a soul and Satan lost a good right arm. They all cried hallelujah when Jesse's head went under. Because this time he went under for the Lord. See, we recognize that that's when people make the decision of Christ and uh, surrender to Christ. And I want to ask you this morning, have you surrendered to Christ? Have you surrendered to Christ? 
And uh, maybe you're one that's here this morning and you've heard this message and you're thinking to yourself, you know, Luke, uh, I, I was baptized into Christ, but I've been holding something back. Maybe I've, I've been doing a lot of good things. I've been reading the Bible. I've been praying to God. But there's some part of my life that I've been holding back, and I want to surrender all to God because I want to be, make sure that I am His disciple. Well, you can do that. Make a decision this morning. You're going to repent of whatever it is, and, and you're going to surrender all to God. You're going to surrender it back to God. You're going to give it back to God. And uh, this surrender can't just last for a week. It has to be a, a lifetime commitment. It has to be throughout the rest of your life, till death, till, we, till we're glorified in Christ and we're risen to, up into heavenly places to stand and sit with the, at the right hand of God with Christ Jesus. This is how long that surrender needs to last. And, and I, I want to ask you, today, are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to say that Jesus is my Lord and willing to make that, that commitment in every aspect of your life, whether it's emotionally or financially or, uh, or personally, whatever, whatever decisions you do, whatever uh, uh, relationships you're in. Maybe that's what's holding you back. Maybe you have a boyfriend or girlfriend that's not willing to surrender like you are, but you don't want to give them up. Unless you're willing to take up my cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. That's what Christ says. Are you going to let a person take away the pearl of great price? Are you going to let some situation here on earth, maybe a job situation or, or, or whatever it is, take you away from those things. It costs your life, but it's worth it. It's worth it. We're going to sing a song this morning, a time of decision, and whatever the decision